guys, uh, we have Coach Niall Berry. He's the assistant coach of the Irish under-18 national team and recently appointed Basketball Island Development Officer for the Midwest. Uh, is that correct? Did I mistake that? Midwest. Yep, you got that right, yeah. Bill. Perfect. So, uh, so he'll be talking to us about Coach Atta's relationship. Um, let's tune in. All right, thanks, Nabil. Uh, well done, Colin. Great, uh, great presentation there, and it really gives a good uh, perspective from the athlete perspective, an athlete that would embrace, I suppose, the teachings uh, of the coach and really uh, kind of further himself in knowledge and try and get to another level. And, and my my perspective is very much from the coach side of things. So I'm going to be talking about the coach athlete relationship from the perspective of the coach and, and what we as coaches need to embrace and what we as coaches need to understand. Uh, in order to foster a positive coach-athlete relationship within our, our teams. Um, so, uh, it, it, it will start, the presentation will start by understanding the coach, it will move on to understanding the athlete, understanding the environment. We'll talk about a few models, um, the 3 plus 1 Cs and the compass models uh, to help us um, create an environment of a positive coach-athlete relationship. Um, and then obviously I'll talk at the end about how we can build a successful coach-athlete relationship over a phase of, of progression. Uh, so to begin with, I started off uh, looking through all college notes. I uh, looked through my coach active relationship uh, papers and, and did a bit of reading to, to formulate my thoughts. And what I came up with was, was the, the multifaceted nature of the coach active relationship and, and everything that it, it touches on. Um, for me, it's important to understand that the coach active relationship should not be considered an add-on or a byproduct of overall coaching process, nor should it be based on athletes' age, gender, or performance, but instead it should be considered as the foundation of all coaching procedure. All right. Um, and that to me is, is said when I go back to this. Oh, I can't go backwards. Sorry. That's not moving for you, Nabil, is it? No, I can I can see the screen with. Uh, okay, wait, it's changing now. All right, sorry, that's after one off from here. I clicked on something wrong there. Hmm. Sorry now. I'm trying to find the presentation for some reason. I'm after clicking over. Sorry now. No, no worries. Take your time. Oh, I'm on the wrong one, sorry. And 2019. All right, so many different files. Here we go. Is that back to you? Yeah, I can see that now. All right, and is it animating? It's moving for you now? Yep. All right, so my apologies. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's the coach active relationship is so multifaceted, it should be seen as, a, as the foundation process for, for all coaching procedure and not just another facet of, uh, of, of coaching. <clears throat> so to start this presentation, my, my question is, is how do we develop our, or do we develop our players? Uh, and my answer to that controversially or probably we don't. We don't develop players um, Socrates would have stated that I cannot teach anybody anything, I can only make them think. Um, so for me as a coach, my job is to create an environment. My job is to uh, provide the knowledge and tools and the pathway to athletes, but inevitably it's, it's, it's each individual athlete's job to develop with my guidance, not with any, um, with, not, I, it's not my personal responsibility. So my job is to create a, an environment of understanding and motivation in, in, in my players. Um, so to understand the coach and going deeper depth to the understanding of the coach, for me, the first and foremost and the foundation of a coach trying to build a positive environment, coach athlete relationship is emotional intelligence. A uh, coach needs to understand their own emotions. They need to be able to perceive their emotions and when they occur, um, they need to be able to manage their emotions and then they need to be able to utilize their emotions as a tool for effective coaching. And so, for example, you're in a game and things get really heated and your players are starting to get over emotional. As a coach, I need to be able to maintain emotional control in order to calm my players to get them thinking clearly and, and, and in an effective process. 
but also in a game, if, if a game is getting to a situation where my, field, my, my team needs an extra bit of energy, an awful lot of the time a player will say, a coach animator or a coach with energy on the side can be the catalyst to spark energy within a team. So as coaches, the foundation of a coach athlete relationship is understanding our, our own emotions and how they connect with players and how our emotions affect our players. <clears throat> I recently did my, my master's thesis on, on um, leadership. So the secondary, the secondary process for me that a coach has to understand is I think a coach has to understand leadership uh, in its intricacies. Uh, I don't think we just show up and we become leaders. I think we have the ability to lead in any platform, but I think we need to understand the leadership. Uh, Tannenbaum and Schmidt identified leadership on a continuum from autocratic leadership on the left uh, to democratic leadership in the middle and then to a lazy fair leadership on, on the right and everywhere in between. Um, and my research, my recent research, um, identified the leader characteristics for each of those types of leadership. So an autocratic coach would be would have a directive approach, a democratic coach would have a collaborative approach, and then a laissez-faire um, leader would have an empowering approach. And then I, I suppose I identify the effects that those approaches and those leadership styles have on the athletes. And, and I said, an autocratic direct coach will have a reactive athlete, and a, a democratic collaborative coach will have a cooperative athlete, whereas, whereas a laissez-faire empowering coach will have an independent athlete. Um, and I think it's very important for us as coaches to understand how our processes affect our athletes and utilize the necessary leadership style for, for what the athlete needs. And if we can utilize the necessary leadership style for what the athlete needs in a moment in time, um, we can get the best out of our athletes and we can foster an, an environment of assisting our athletes to be the best version of themselves and being successful. And finally, for me, a coach needs to understand motivation and they need to understand their own motivation. Are they people oriented in motivation? Do they, is, is that the drive for why they want to coach? Are they achievement oriented? I mean, is that their drive? Is their drive for wins and, and only wins? Or are they a collaborative people and achievement oriented, which are probably the most successful coaches, is that they want to develop people, but they also want to win. We as, uh, as players, we always want to win. And if we have a coach that's just people oriented and just development oriented, we don't have the motivation to go that extra mile for that coach. But if we have a coach that's just achievement oriented, we don't, uh, players don't have the, you know, the buy-in from a people oriented player. We don't think that, that the coach cares about them. So a coach for me needs to be able to uh, understand motivation and needs to have people and achievement orientation uh, from a motivation perspective. How that impacts on the athlete and understanding the athlete. Um, so for me as a coach, and I, I believe that we don't coach basketball players. We coach people who play basketball. Um, and that's the fundamental thinking behind, the co uh, behind a successful and efficient uh, coach-athlete relationship. If we can understand that learning about our players and learning what each makes each player tick and adapting our coaching processes, we can bring out the best in every single athlete. Um, so to, to do that, we look at Hollander's model of personality. And so Hollander, uh, identified 1967, uh, three layers of a, of a person's personality. Uh, and the first layer is the, is the outer layer, and that's the role-related behavior. Uh, and the role-related behavior is, is typically what, what a, a, an athlete will identify themselves in certain situations. So they're, they're a type of student, they're, they're an employee, they're a friend, you know, they, they, whatever they identify themselves as, they change their perspective or they change their personality based on that. A, a, an athlete may be completely different in school than he will be on the basketball court, or he may be completely different in the basketball court than he is at home. Uh, quite often, the stereotype for a basketball player is, is really energetic on the floor, but then when they get off the floor, it's really laid back and it's completely, completely changed based on the role that they perceive themselves in. So their, their attitude and their, their um, personality changes. Whereas the typical responses is the, is the middle layer. It's, it's, it's a little bit deeper into an athlete's un understanding an athlete. And it's basically how they feel based on their role related behavior. So um, it's, as I said, if I'm, if I'm laid back, that's more of a typical response. You know, if I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I'm energetic, if I'm happy, if I'm angry, if I'm aggressive, these are all typical responses and they generally come out in different situations. And then finally, the psychological core. The psychological core is where an athlete, any person's fundamental belief system. So this is who the person truly is in. Not too many people get to see to somebody's psychological core. But we as coaches spend so much time with our athletes and we, we foster such positive relationships or, 
or we, we, we try to foster such positive relationships, we actually are one of the few people that can have an opportunity to get a little bit closer to our athletes and understand what their values are, what makes them tick, what is the important things to them. As a coach, if we coach the role-related behavior, we can only affect change on one small piece of the athlete. But if we, if we can get to an understanding of the psychological core, we can affect the whole the athlete as a whole, their personality, and we can actually help them in any platform that they need to be helped in based on understanding their values. And every player is different. Um, I was speaking to Pat Burke, we'd often say there's symptoms and there's problems. If I have a runny nose, if I have a headache, if I have a fever, if I have a lot of symptoms, um, but the underlying problem is the flu. Now, I can treat a headache, I can treat a fever, I can treat a, a tummy ache, I can treat all the symptoms individually, or I can treat the flu and, and, and treat all those symptoms in one go. Uh, and that for me is, is one of the most important things that coach needs to identify is can we get to the, to the root and, and really affect positive change on young athletes and build a positive coach-athlete relationship. Um, for me, a lot of, I, I, I would have, I would have said it in the past and I would have heard a lot of coaches say that that kid has a, a positive or a negative attitude, that kid has a good or bad attitude, and I like to identify attitudes on a continuum. I don't believe there's any such, there's a such thing as somebody with a bad attitude or a good attitude. Your attitude is determined by your situation. It's, it's not fixed. Um, so if an athlete is coming to us consistently with a bad attitude, if I understand my athletes, I can understand what is causing that bad attitude because you don't wake up in the morning wanting to have a bad attitude. A kid might go to school with a great attitude, spend a day in school, and by the end of the day have a bad attitude, and I'm getting them as a coach at the end of the day, and I consistently think that kid has a bad attitude. Um, that kid doesn't have a bad attitude. It's just whatever's happening in his environment is giving him a bad attitude. And if I really understand my athlete, and if I can really foster a good, positive um, coach athlete relationship with my athlete, I can help them overcome those negative aspects and, and act in a more positive way from an attitude perspective. Um, so that's, that's something that's very important for me to understand in the coach athlete relationship. Um, that leads me to, to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, and we as coaches, I think, have, an, have a, a desire to try and say that all these kids need to try and be the, the best versions of themselves. I want to make this kid the best he can be. Um, and then a lot of the time kids come to us and, and they, 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 they don't have the safety or physiological needs that, that is required for them to actually go towards self-actualization or to have a high self-esteem. Um, so Maslow identified needs as, as a hierarchical system where you have to have your physiological needs met before you can have your safety needs met, before you actually have your love and belonging needs met, your esteem needs, and then and only then will you move on to self-actualization and actually being the best version of yourself and going after your dreams and what you want to do and what you want to achieve. We as coaches, I suppose, if we can get to the psychological core or we can get to the understanding of the athlete, we can understand where a kid is in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we can coach them specific to what they need. All right, my superstar on my team, he might be headed towards self-actualization, but my bench player might be looking for safety. You know, they might not have a great positive home environment and they might be coming to basketball as their, their need for safety. Or they, there might be some people out there, they have the physiological and safety needs, but they don't have, maybe they have parents that work a lot to try and provide for them and they don't have those love and belonging needs. And, and if we can provide that within a team, if they, I heard Puff yesterday talk about family, we can provide that, then those kids are going to buy in so much more. But for me, every single kid is different in that regard. And we have to understand what kids' need, our needs are and then coach specific to their needs, not coaching specific to our needs as coaches. Um, that coach also needs to understand motivation. And this goes back to coaching each individual specifically. <clears throat> Uh, some players are amotivated. They're, they're not motivated to do anything. They, they don't play basketball because they enjoy basketball. They play basketball because their friends play basketball and they have nothing to do. Um, they're not bad kids. They're just not motivated to play. Other kids are, are incredibly intrinsically motivated. They, they, they love the game of basketball. They show up every time to, to be the best version of themselves, to, um, to, to be the most successful player on the team and then inevitably on, on, uh, within the country. And, and we need to understand the difference between those two. But... I would say the vast majority of kids are somewhere in the extrinsic motivation. Um, so this is Decky and Ryan's continuum, and it's continuum from a motivation to, to intrinsic motivation. And in between, there are levels of extrinsic motivation. So the external regulation um, is, is all about uh, rewards and punishment. Um, kids are motivated by rewards and punishment. Uh, when the kid can move on, introjection is, is kind of there's an ego involvement, and it's all about 
you know, they're focused on getting approval from their peers and from their coaches. When they move through identification um, motivation, they, they're in a situation where they're, they value the activity, they value what they're doing, and they're motivated by just doing the activity. You know, they're not trying to be the best version of themselves. They're motivated just to be, be involved. And integration is the next step up from that. They really enjoy the process. They don't necessarily want, need the rewards. They just enjoy the process, and the process is the external motivation that they get. If we can identify where an athlete falls on each one of these motivational skills, we can identify the next step to help them motivate. Um, and when I go back and I say we can coach, uh, we don't develop athletes, we can, we can motivate them you know, and educate them. We, for me, it's developing that understanding of motivation so that we can help them get to the next level of motivation so that we can actually have an intrinsically motivated group of players. <coughs> um, and then finally, for, from a understanding the athlete perspective, this is a strength and condition, and this is the windows of, of trainability in athletes. Now, I'm not talking about strength and conditioning, but I am using this graph for a reason. Uh, this is a graph that chronolog uh, moves chronologically from five years of age to 20 plus uh, of an athlete development. And the windows are there that heighten windows of opportunity to develop athletes uh, amongst in a strength and condition capacity. But there's a PHP spike in the middle of every adolescent adolescence growth, somewhere between the age of 12 years of age and 15 years of age, where kids grow massively. Uh, they, they have a massive growth spurt. They go from five foot seven to six foot, or they go from they maybe five foot two to, to five foot eight or five foot nine. Um, and in that period of PHV, not only are they susceptible to injuries or susceptible to a, I suppose, a loss of, of energy. But they're also, their body secretes a, a, sort of a lot of hormones that we as, as coaches have to understand. Um, for females, it's estrogen. For males, it's testosterone. And the heightened level of testosterone, specifically in a young man's body, um, creates, creates basically an athlete on steroids. Now, that's a small window of maybe six or eight weeks. Um, but we as coaches have our athletes in that window. 13 years of age, 14 years of age, a kid comes into us. And they're they're super aggressive, and they and they don't know why they're super aggressive, and and we label them sometimes we label them as coaches we label them aggressive you know we label them unstable we label them out of control, and if a coach consistently tells you you're unstable you're out of control or you're uncoachable and and we don't understand that they're actually going through something, eventually because an athlete looks up to a coach and because a coach is a massive influence on a young man or woman in in those times. Inevitably, they start to have a self-fulfilling prophecy of maybe I am aggressive, or maybe I am emotionally out of control. We actually educate our players on to be the on to be worse versions themselves based on a moment of time where they they've been they were going through a growth uh, a situation. Um, so for me as a coach, I always have to try and understand exactly where my athlete is and make sure at first do no harm and make sure at first we we help athletes to get through the phases in their life and not actually combat them when they're in those phases. Uh, I have one little story on this. When I was in Hoops Life <coughs> with Pat Burke in Florida, the first year I was there, a young man came into me at 12 years of age, and he was six, feet, he was six foot one. Um, and his parent came to me initially and sat down with me and Pat and said, look, this, he's very lazy. Um, he, you got, you're going to have to work with him. You have to work with him because I can't get him to get up off the couch and go do stuff. So we sat down with the athlete and we spoke to him, 12 years of age, and we just asked him, we said, we said you're very tall. I mean, when did, when did you grow? And he said at the start of the summer, he was five foot seven and, and now he's, he's six foot one. Um, and, and so for me, I identified it that you're not a lazy, you're not a lazy athlete. You, your problem is, is that you've just grown massively. Imagine among the amount of energy your body has expended to grow to that level. Imagine, are you taking in the required amount of food in order to refuel and re-energize your body? No, you're not. So you're not lazy. You're just you're lacking the energy because you're not eating enough food or you're not giving yourself enough rest. And you're not giving your body enough time to recover. But when you get past this period of growth, your energy is going to come back. And at that point, you're going to be a six foot one energetic um, uh, player. And, and that kid from that moment started eating more and started. Into, and, and he became the most energetic kid in the gym. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy to the point where he came in the gym. We actually just had to stop him jumping up on the baskets. Uh, and that, to me, is coaching. Understanding athletes and not labeling our athletes, not making them feel like they're something they're not. Let's try and help them become something that they want to be um, and help them through those moments in their life. All right, so to do that, we need to understand the environment. <clears throat> and the environment is kind of the last little piece besides the models that we're going to talk about. Um, there's three, there's four types of, of environment. There's an unsuccessful, 
um, an inefficient coaching process environment. So where a coach doesn't win games and they don't have a good coach athlete relationship. There's an unsuccessful but effective um, uh, coach athlete relationship environment where we don't win games, but we have a very effective coach athlete relationship and process. So our players are developing, they're becoming the best version of themselves, but we haven't identified winning as one of our primary targets. So all of a sudden we're great basketball players, but we just don't have it. We don't have the ability to win because it's not our goal. Um, there's a successful but ineffective um, coaching environment where the team is actually successful, but we don't have a good coach athlete relationship. The coach actually isn't developing us massively. We just have probably the more talented players, and our coach is, is so um, success driven that he's actually willing us to victory or manages games well, um, or he's maybe autocratically pushing us to victory. We're winning games, but we're not enjoying the process. Um, and all three of these. Uh, environments, they don't have longevity when it comes to a coach athlete relationship. Inevitably, you either have turnover of coaches or you have turnover of players based on the lack of success or the lack of, of coach athlete relationship. <clears throat> the environment we're striving to get to is a successful and effective coach athlete relationship environment where we're winning games. Winning is very much a part of our focus, but we're also developing and we're looking to be effective in our strategies. And, and this is probably the, the most important thing I'll talk about today because too many times we get caught up in developing our players and we don't focus on winning as, as a priority. And inevitably what we do is we, we end up in a situation where we have an unsuccessful but effective coaching environment where our players are very good but they can't win. <coughs> um, and, and a lot of the time we have the opposite. We have a successful coaching or successful program with an ineffective coach and athlete relationship, uh, coaching environment. So our players aren't happy, but they're winning, but they don't really care about winning because they're not happy. And, and so we always have that conflict. The only way we can get to a successful situation is if we have a successful environment with an effective coaching process where we actually get our players to enjoy the game, but focus on winning as a priority. Um, so how do, we, how do we identify that? So uh, a flower, oh, so, okay. so a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Um, and that's, that to me is, is what is important for my coaching relationship with my athletes. Inevitably, we're trying to get flowers that blossom and bloom, but we don't, we don't fix the flowers. We don't work with the flowers. I love root. Um, we don't work with flowers. We work with soil. We work with our pots. We work with the sun. We work with the environment that we create in order for a flower to bloom. All right. When, once a flower starts to grow and starts to bloom, we don't treat the flower, we treat the soil. We water the soil, we give it sun, we make sure and create an environment that it naturally grows. And that's why for me it's, it's important that we identify that we, we, um, we don't develop players, we provide the environment to, for which players grow and develop. Um, the seeds we sow in that soil to begin with are inevitably what the flowers uh, will turn out to be. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So. The soil for me is a player pathway. As a coach, we have to lay out a player pathway so that when we plant the seeds and when we talk to our players, they understand what they're going to learn and where they're going to improve and how they're going to get there. And if they can understand that, they can emotionally connect to a journey. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to just take our word on it. And this is the Ulster uh, GAA player pathway. And I think it's actually fantastic to break down the technical, the, the physical, the tactical components of the game and what kids should learn at each stage of their development. And you sit down with an athlete and you, you tell them this is this is the direction we're heading in. All of a sudden you motivate a kid. All of a sudden you provide the knowledge that necessary to inspire them to to want to start to practice and become a, become the best version of themselves. And um, Irish rugby, IRFU do it fantastically well. And I have, I've read a few of these and for me they break it down to a, a fine art and a fine detail. But uh, imagine sitting with an athlete and creating a soil of this is the environment you're going to be developed in. Um, if you can tell a kid what they're going to learn year in, year out, the motivation can, continues uh, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fade away, you know, it stays um, and you make winning a part of that process. <clears throat> Evaluations is like watering the plants, it's watering the soil. Um, so for our soil, sorry. So for me, if you think about plants and you think about the growth of a plant, if you don't water a, a plant, uh, you don't water it effectively, and if you don't water it consistently, inevitably what happens to the plant is it starts to wither and it starts to die <clears throat> because the motivation to improve is lost in, in your subjective view of what they should be ach achieving. So for me, if you don't evaluate consistently often, and if you don't sit with players on a consistent often, uh, often basis, and you tell them what you're looking to achieve, and you tell them how much they've grown, 
they start to lose a little bit of motivation. They start to revert down that um, uh, motivation continuum that I identified by Decky and Ryan. They start to go from intrinsic motivation through the levels of extrinsic motivation to inevitably where they're, they're, they're not motivated to, to, to achieve. So we want to achieve, uh, we want to build roses, we want to build tulips, we want to build daisies, like whatever we're planting. I know this is a crazy analogy, but I think it, it, it hits home for me. Whatever we're planting, we're planting from the word go. So if I plant a daisy uh, and my daisy is, uh, grows, I, I can't turn around after my daisy is finished growing and say I want to do to be a rose. I planted a daisy, I can't have a rose. Uh, if I planted a tulip, I can't have a rose. <coughs> um, and often cultures will create an environment of development. And for me, that's planting a daisy. I want you to develop to this level. And when you develop to this level, level then I'll teach you how to win at 18, 19, 20. Um, unfortunately, there are daisy by 18, 19, 20, and you can't turn a daisy into a rose. If you want to create an environment of athletes winning and athletes also developing, um, and you want to create a successful and effective coaching environment and a coach-athlete relationship, you have to plant seeds early of winning and developing, and they have to do both at the same time. And by the time they get to the end of that, um, they get to the end of that journey. Now there are roads. It might take a bit of time to get there. You might take an awful lot of watering the plants. It might take an awful lot of giving them sunlight. But inevitably, they will become a rose based on your uh, what you've done to the environment. <clears throat> so again, yeah, this is and this is very important that we understand that if you don't foster a successful environment uh, in, from the get go, and then you. <coughs> You can't be upset that you don't have a successful environment at the end. You know, if you don't harbor a good and uh, an effective coach athlete relationship from the word go through your processes, you can't be upset when you get to 18 years of age and your kid doesn't listen to anything you say um, because you haven't harbored that. We haven't created the environment for a successful coach athlete relationship. So, just to talk a little bit about models in the last five minutes of this presentation, I will hopefully connect all this together. Uh, the three plus one C's uh, model is, is about the quality of the coach after relationship and how a coach can build this quality. Um, in 2005, Joe had, uh, released a paper talking about three, the three C's and those three C's were closeness, commitment and complementarity. Um, so the closeness uh, part of it is that is, is having a mutual respect, appreciation and a trust for one another. That, that goes both ways with a coach and an athlete. And, and us as coaches, we take the lead on, on, on fostering that. Um, the commitment side of things is that if both coach and the athlete believe that we're going to create something that's, that's a relationship that lasts time, that it's not just a, a stopgap or not just a quick fix, but I want to be coaching with you or I want to be playing for you in five years from now, that creates a, a, a much deeper coach-athlete relationship. Um, so the uh, complementary one is, is that if, we're, if we complement each other, so if our mindsets complement each other, or if the coach can adapt to the athlete and complement the athlete's process to help them be successful, um, it creates a deeper coach athlete relationship. And then in 2007, um, Joe had added the, the co orientation um, portion of this. So, the, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> so, the co orientation is, is the agreements in place and the, the coach's perception of the relationship quality, coach and athlete's uh, perception of the relationship quality. Um, do we have a high quality relationship? Or do we have a relationship that's based off of, um, um, you know, of mutual, just mutual successes? Um, the compass model, uh, it breaks down into probably a little bit deeper and it breaks it down into conflict management, openness, motivation, positivity, advice, support, and then social networks. And in order to create an effective and, uh, effective and successful coach athlete relationship, uh, coaches need to have strategies of conflict management, both proactive, so we build up a base, and then reactive when, when we have conflict within our teams or conflict within our own relationship, that we have strategies to overcome that and not just accept, accept conflict as, as a part of the norm. Conflict is good if it's managed. Conflict is not good if it's, if it's let run right. Um, openness, so that we're openness to talk about sport and to talk about anything, um, of, uh, anything that, that is of value to a player and a coach. Uh, that we are open to talk about motivation and that we are help, able to help athletes increase their effort and that the athletes will increase their effort because the relationship is, 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 a, is one of fostering a high motivation. It's a positive environment uh, that we are able to give advice. Uh, so we give support, um, sports communication, we give feedback, we give constructive feedback and reward feedback, um, that we have support for each other, that we have assurance, 
sport specific sport support but also that the athlete feels like they have personal support if they need it um and more often than not you don't we don't provide personal support but that the, uh, the athlete has to feel like you have their back you know in, in those situations and then social networks you know are we socializing together do we have a shared social network do we have situations where a coach and an athlete can see different perspectives of each other the role related behaviors can you see what i'm like as as a family member can you see what i'm like with my friends can we see what can we see what each other are like in a social setting and, and get a deeper understanding for each other um to finish this off and this is the last slide um i was talking to tim rice last night and he talked he he um, shared with me that it's good to try and to kind of bring this together to share with people what this looks like over time so Tuckman's uh, forming, norming, storming, and performing stages of group formation <coughs> uh, dictates that, that the um, athletes move through forming, through a storming phase, into a norming, and then a performance phase. And for me, the coach and athlete relationship changes based on the phase. Um, so in the forming stage, uh, a coach's responsibility is to evaluate, to evaluate an athlete's personality, their motivation, their needs, and their emotions, and to understand our own emotions. Uh, our job is to evaluate them technically, tactically, physically, and mentally to see what the components are and what they can provide to a team. Our job is to create our long-term athlete development pathways for a season or for five seasons, but sit down with a co an athlete and identify a, a, a development pathway. But this is where I see you in five years from now. These are the areas in which you need to improve, but this is the areas where you can already provide massive value to this team. Uh, and we plant seeds in the forming stage, and we plant seeds of development, effective coach-athlete relationships, and we also plant seeds of success is that what do we want to achieve what do we want to achieve over a performance over a year or five years what do we want to achieve over two months three months what do we want to achieve in the forming stage what do we want to achieve in this next session and for me you have to plant the seed of success in outcome goals and winning in that in that moment and you have to have that throughout your whole process um, if you don't you will get to a situation where you develop tulips but you, you and you want roses uh, and that's that's very important for me um, the coach responsibility in the storming phase is massively in conflict management and proactive and reactive strategies of conflict management to try and help athletes to overcome conflict that undoubtedly comes up in the storming phase. Um, we need to educate our athletes on emotional intelligence and intelligent and emotional regulation. So have them understand why when they react emotionally to things, have them understand how to regulate their emotions and, and, and embrace their emotions. Their emotions can be a source of great power if we can control them and regulate them but they are a source of great weakness if, if we don't. So we have to understand how to use them. Um, I think a coach needs to understand the, the hierarchy of needs. And I think in the conflict stage, in the, in the storming phase of group formation, I think it's, it, it becomes apparent where an athlete is when it comes on a hierarchy of needs situation. I sit down with your athletes or even just in practices, you can start to get a feel for, for if, 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 if a, an athlete has their love and belonging um, catered for, if they have their safety needs catered for, if they're actually in a, in a self-actualization phase or in a self-esteem phase and, and identify strategies then on how we can help each individual athlete and then build a strong foundation, foundation for our coach-athlete relationship. <coughs> and, Storming, we need to teach them about self-regulation and emotional intelligence. And I think that's important for the coach in that moment too. If I have a very uh, high emotional regulation um, and emotional intelligence, I won't react emotionally to conflict within the team. I will react with emotional calmness and then be able to help people to get through emotional spikes. In the norming phase, um, coach's responsibility is to set collective goals. In my, my opinion, we set goals in norming, not in forming. I think we set goals when a team has established um, the, the hierarchical structures within their team, when they establish the power dominance, when they have established who are the leaders within the team and what are the parameters, and now we're kind of like, oh, everybody starts to accept their roles. This is where we set collective goals. Uh, we set goals for what we want to achieve based on what we can uh, visibly see our evaluation of, of this team's strengths and weaknesses. Um, we have to uh, we have to have athlete motivation. We have to understand athlete motivation and motivate each each athlete individually based on what they want to achieve to get them moving in the right direction. Um, we have to reevaluate our players, so we, we water the plants. We have to water the plants probably at each phase, but the forming, storming, uh, norming, and forming should all have evaluation phases, <clears throat> technically, tactically, physically, and mentally. We want to have adaptive strategies, and then we want to have increased coaching at this point. So this is where we actually introduce, as I said, we introduce our concepts. This is where we introduce our gameplay. This is where we introduce our, our playing style <clears throat> based on the strengths of the teams and the leadership in the team. And in the performance phase, this is the coach's responsibility to, to get out of the way. 
I think once, once a player, once a trainer is on the track and it's moving at full steam, I mean, trying to coach and trying to overcoach or trying to implement new strategies in, in the performance phase is basically limiting the potential for for your for maximizing your success as, a, as an athlete or your athlete's success. So the most, the most important thing in that phase is to get out of the way and, and enjoy enjoy the process. Um, we want to have a balanced approach to leadership. So we, we need to have an autocratic approach to leadership for when our athletes need our help to be successful uh, in games and maybe two, two minutes on the clock or maybe 30 seconds on the clock down by two, they need direction. We need to be an autocratic leader and provide direction for them. You know, they may be in, within the middle of a game and in, in a flow state, they need us to be a laissez-faire coach and kind of sit back and say, all right, you go do your thing, you know, go play your game. Um, they may, may need democratic process, there may be conflict within us, we may be coming through motions, but for me, allowing them to figure out situations is actually going to officially, is going to build their leadership and build them up to, to more successful. So we want to have a balanced approach to leadership. Um, Remember, a successful and effective coaching environment is one where we want to win and we want to we want to harbor a good, effective coaching uh, coach athlete relationship and good processes of development. Um, it's not just about either or. Uh, we need to evaluate in the performing phase. Motivational needs are, are need to be evaluated, um, and and our emotions need to be evaluated. Uh, and we need to be adaptable to our athletes in the situation. So, for example, once we get into the performing phase. If certain athletes are going to outperform other athletes, and there's going to be certain players within our teams that are not feeling like their needs are being met from a playing point of view, as coaches, we need to identify who needs more motivation, who needs us to, to help them with their needs, who needs us to evaluate them and, and share with them the long-term vision and share with them that this is just a moment in the long-term vision, that this isn't something that you're just, you're not part of the process. Uh, you, you're a big part of the process, you're a big part of what we're trying to achieve, but right now you have to get through this challenge to get to here and motivate those athletes to get to that next level. And that coach athlete relationship really fosters that. And I think finally, and this is the last point I'm going to make, but the coach athlete relationship within Tuckman stages is cyclical. It's not it's not a fix, we go from forming to performing and then we're performing forever. It, like, once we have an adjoining space, um, there we... Uh, we go back to the storming phase of group formation. So uh, an adjoining phase may be the end of the season where everything stops and we go back to the very start. It may be an injury to a key player and all of a sudden the, the power dynamic or the group dynamic changes. You know, maybe some a player leaving the team. We had a situation like that in Port Leash last year where Kareem left mid-season and we started off the second half of the season back at the storming phase and trying to figure out those power struggles and I had to adapt my coaching processes based on what my athletes need. Um, so we have to be adaptable and we have to have process for each phase of group formation, but the coach athlete relationship needs to be built up in every phase of that. Um, and that's it. That's, that's, that's my, I'll bring Nabil back in here now, and if, he's any, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That was, uh, that was really good, coach. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, really? You, you flew through that. Good job. <laughs> I, I tried to get it done. I apologize if I went too fast. No, no, I thought it was really good. Uh, I thought it was really good. Let's see if we can pull up some of the questions because I know there there were some that came in. Um, here we go. Um, if I can get, yeah, there it is. So the first one that's come up is, um, you know, you talked about the emotional control. So what are some mechanisms that a coach can use to get themselves in control emotionally after losing uh, losing the, these emotions on the sidelines? Two, for me, mechanisms, there's two main ones for me. First one is acceptance. Uh, I think that the longer we stay, if we get emotional and then we get upset that we got emotional, we just get more emotional. Um, so it doesn't actually, it doesn't help us get past that moment. So when, if like I, I've lost it. I mean, I got kicked out of a gym last year for the first time in my career, but I, I mean, I was overly emotional. It's <laughs> fair, like, um, but I didn't, I didn't regulate myself. Uh, and I think inevitably, if I get overly emotional and I make a bad decision, I, I have to accept I got an over emotion, I made a bad decision, we suffer from it, but there's no point dwelling on it, accept that fact, let's move on and try and regulate myself again, and then and move forward, and then I can readdress it in the second thing, that, uh, the second process, which is reflective practice. Um, I, I believe reflective practice after games with your coaching staff and with and by yourself can help you identify what you did, what you would have preferred to do, what you should have done, or what you could do next time, and a lot of them, when you have that reflective practice and you really, really think about it, the next time that situation occurs, you're, you're in a, you have a different mindset to it and, and you are more in control. So acceptance and reflective practice. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, the next question is a bit of a, I'm going to read a little bit, so just bear with me. 
Um, coach says a lot of information there about coach and athlete relationships, greatly received. Regarding underage players, parents, carers have a huge influence on the relationship that exists between coaches and athletes. Do you have any advice to ensure that a positive environment is maintained, even when the coach and parent do not always share the same opinion? Yes. Um, my opinion on this, and this may be, this may not be what people want to hear. If a parent has an idea for their kid, if they have a concept, a self -con or a concept that this is who their kid should be, and if a kid has a self concept of this is who they want to be, if I have a difference of opinion from the athlete or the parent, I'm in the wrong, not them. And for me, it, it's, it's this simple: is that we're all on the same team. We all want our, we all want this kid to be the best version of themselves. We all want this kid to be successful. As I said last week, the only difference is, is that my approach and the parents' approach are two, are two different approaches. We have different mindsets or different ideas on what it is. Now, inevitably, I, even if I'm in that kid's life for 10 years, if it, and that's probably the max you'll get a coach at your relationship for, after 10 years, I, can, I may walk out of that kid's life and they may walk out of my life, but their parent is still going to be their parent for the next 30 years, 40 years. So who am I to create conflict between a parent, a child, and myself? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the outside influence. If, if I can't build a bridge or if I can't make a successful coach happy relationship with a parent to try and affect positive change on the athlete, then I, as a coach, have a responsibility to, to step back and not create conflict to put that athlete in a position where they can't, be, they can't progress and, and get more, be more successful. And, and hope that, that what I can do is affect positive change on the athlete in small snippets rather than holistically, you know. Let me let me challenge that a little bit, but before I do, uh, I'm I'm on the same kind of page as yourself. Whereas, yeah, I think there needs to be communication between the coaches and parents. And for the most part, we're in this together, and we want to see that uh, the best for the athlete. If, if I challenge you there for a second and say, what if in this case the what the parents' philosophy, shall we say, about playing time or or growth or how they perceive their child should develop? is different from yours as a coach and what you're trying to build with the team it's not wrong but it's just different how would you handle that um parents generally are every parent thinks their kid is a superstar um i don't think i don't the parents that don't believe their kids are superstars aren't at the games and really don't care and that's and that's that's a harsh thing to say but that's i've been in too many situations where parents don't show up um, they think their player kid is just playing for for fun, and they really, you know they're not as engaged in their development as a basketball player. They care more about them in an educational sense. They care more about them as a personal development sense. Um, but the ones that show up and generally are there day in day out, they generally see their athlete as a superstar. Now, for me, an athlete can be very talented, but inevitable superstardom is, is NBA guys. There's always a way in which we can develop. So from, there's always conflict between a parent and, an, and a coach because we generally have different views of, of where little Billy is and his development. Um, my, my job and my role, I, I try to connect with parents as much as I can to identify what they see for their son or daughter and what they want for their son or daughter. And I try to identify really early what they, they actually want for themselves. And if I can build a positive working relationship with that parent of how I have their best interest at heart in the long term, I think a parent generally buys in for what I'm trying to do. Um, if I can create an environment of a player pathway and show a parent, this is what I'm trying to do with your, your son. If I can water the plants and create valuations, parents generally don't argue with you if they feel like you're, you're, you have due process. They'll argue with you if, you if they feel like you're giving your subjective view of what their son or daughter should be doing and their subjective view is different to yours. They'll argue with that and they can argue with that. And who am I to not to, to say my subjective view is better than yours? I'm just a person too. You know? Well, it's a really good point. Obviously, when you, like you said, when you evaluate, you've got your uh, tangible, you know, evidence and it's objective. Of course, it, it creates a different conversation between you and the parent. Uh, still being devil's advocate here, what if we're coaches who don't have the time to, or don't have the assistant coaches, so we can't, not that we can't, but we just don't have the time or we can't make the time to evaluate, to put all these you know things in order uh, what practical advice can you give them that they can maybe start making those small steps to being better themselves as coaches this for me is a difficult one and i actually thought about this i actually knew you were going to ask this question <laughs> this is difficult for me <laughs> i'm i'm i have the time 
and, and that's the thing. Like I would prefer to stay an hour after practice and and and, and have a conversation with a parent or a, a player then go home and watch match of the day. I have the time. I can record match of the day and watch it tomorrow morning for breakfast, and that's fine for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not in a family situation, so I suppose it's a hard one for me to say that make the time, but my, my mindset is very much make the time. Um, but I understand other people can make the time because of family commitments, other work commitments, and other commitments that they have. Um, I, I, yeah, I suppose so I can't resonate in that area. I would say that it's, for me, probably the most important part of coaching. Uh, like we all, and these, these webinars and these, these online clinics have been fantastic for sharing coaching process, sharing how we coach actions, sharing how we coach different facets of the game, fast breaks, half court basketball, everything that goes with it. I think they've been fantastic. But for me, all of that stuff goes out the window if you don't have a positive coach athlete relationship because the athlete's not going to learn from you. They're not, you know, that they're, they're going to go home and have conflict with their parents where they don't think that you actually have their best interests at heart. And when they show up, they're showing up not motivated. I think if you take the time to spend with your athletes and develop a positive coach at relationship, you can get done in an, in 40 minutes what would take you two hours in an unmotivated clinch. Um, just to add, and I hope you don't mind that I'm going to add a little bit to, to your answer. Um, I do agree with coach in the sense that the first 15 minutes before practice starts and, and the last 15 minutes before uh, after practice ends, they're, they're absolutely critical. To, to develop in this coach-athlete relationship. And I would add, not only is the coach-athlete relationship important, but it's the coach-athlete-parent relationship. So you almost have like a triangle where you can use this time to connect. Now, obviously enough, uh, if you're in a situation where you don't have the time because you're not a full-time coach like myself or Coach Nile, right, and you, th those 15 minutes, you can connect with two players in that. And even if you connect with two players every couple of weeks, it's still connecting with two players and their parents. And I think that goes a long way. It's, it's better than not connecting at all. So uh, just thought I'd add my two cents there, Coach. I hope you don't mind. No, absolutely um, agree. Perfect. So we are coming to the end of our, our, our clinic. Really do appreciate you, Coach, taking the time. I have a ton more questions, and I hope to connect with you, over, obviously, over, over the next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll get a chance to catch up. Guys, if you do have any other questions that we haven't covered here, just fire them across. We'll be delighted to, to take the time and, and uh, answer those questions. Coach Nile, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you, it, and we'll connect again. Sir, all right.